This video will help you understand the difference between effective and marginal tax rates. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris Dime. I'm a financial planner out of Edmonds, Washington, and I specialize in working with folks to and through retirement. One of the most confusing topics out there is taxes, and for good reason. There's a lot of nuance to be had. Specifically though, as it pertains to tax rate calculations, there's oftentimes confusion on how best to estimate one's tax liability. And the fundamental issue comes down to understanding the difference between effective and marginal tax rates. So in today's video, we'll break down how to calculate each one of these different estimation tools, and then ultimately in which situations it's best to use either one. So let's jump in. I thought this video would be helpful because I hear a lot of times in meetings, things like I'm in the 23% tax bracket, or I hear from prospective clients stories in the past when they miscalculated how much they'd actually owe the IRS. And the fundamental issue here comes down to misapplying either effective or marginal tax rates. For a quick refresher on how U.S. federal income taxes apply, it's done so on a marginal basis. And if you already know how all this stuff works, you can go ahead and skip ahead. The federal income tax system is made up of various marginal brackets, or brackets of income that are applied a specific tax rate, whereby a certain amount of income is applicable at various tax rates, and then ultimately you add up all those various tax rates and how they apply to your income, and that gets you the total amount of tax that you'll owe. And the U.S. tax system is a progressive tax system, which means the more you make, the more you pay in income taxes. I've got a previous explainer video that clarifies how this stuff applies using some real world examples. We're only covering the high level overview in this video. Now, different tax filing statuses have different marginal brackets, whether you're single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, or the head of a household. Those are all gonna have different brackets that apply to the different percentages of income tax. And I'll link below to the official tax rates published by the IRS that break down how each one of these different tax filing statuses apply to various brackets. But let's take a married filing jointly couple that makes $300,000, for example. On the first $24,000 of income, they're gonna pay 10% in income taxes. On the next $73,000 of income, they're gonna pay 12% in taxes. On the next $110,000, they're gonna pay 22% in taxes. And then to finish it off, the next $95,000 of income is gonna be taxed at 24%. And then so on and so forth, if they made more income, you'd climb into the 32, 35, and then 37% income tax brackets. But those don't apply to this couple making 300 grand, and they would only apply if they were making $400,000 or more. Now there are two main ways to estimate the tax rate that this couple is gonna pay for any particular tax move they make throughout the year. The easiest and simplest one to understand, in my opinion, is what is their marginal tax rate? Well, if we go back to the example, their marginal tax rate is the highest possible income tax rate that's being applied to their income, which in this case is 24%. Now, as we can see here, all of their income is not taxed at 24%, only the income that falls into that 24% income bracket. We'll talk more about how marginal tax rates are gonna be used, but ultimately on this taxpayer, if you add all of these various percentages up applied to those specific brackets, you'll find that they'll owe about $58,000 in total taxes this year. The second most common way to look at tax rates is to use the effective tax rate calculation. And it's a bit more complicated and really hard to do in your head. And for my more math nerdy type people, this would be done through calculating your weighted arithmetic mean. Essentially, you look at which tax rates apply to this couple, which in this example on $300,000, they're taxed at the 10, 12, 22, and 24% bracket. But, but to do this calculation correctly, you would assign weights to these various percentages, and that all amalgamates to a weighted average tax rate of somewhere in the ballpark of like 19%. Now, we're not gonna get into exactly how to do that calculation. Uh, it's kind of boring, and ultimately, there's a number of free online calculators, one of which I'll link down below, to do this math for you. And if you take that 19.23% calculation and you multiply it by their $300,000 of income, you'll get coincidentally the exact same amount of taxes owed as when in the previous example, we added things up to a marginal basis. Again, that $58,000 or so in taxes. So if both tax rate calculations get you to the same answer or the total amount of taxes owed, why do you need to know the difference between the two? Well, ultimately it comes down to how they are applied. Generally, I have found that using the marginal tax rate, which for this taxpayer is 24%, using the marginal tax rate is much better at estimating the tax liability one will owe when making ad hoc financial decisions throughout the year, aka when tax moves are done at the margin or in addition to everything else that typically happens for you in a tax year. 
So for example, if I'm gonna to recommend to a client in this situation to do a $90,000 Roth conversion, one follow-up question is how much is that gonna cost them by way of taxes to the IRS? Now, we're only talking about federal income taxes at this point. Uh, of course, if there's state income taxes, you'd have to go do that math, again, at the margin if applicable. On the effective tax rate side, you could multiply that 90,000 by 19.23%. That was their effective tax bracket. Or you could multiply this 90,000 by their highest marginal tax bracket or 24%. Well, the effective tax rate says they'll owe the IRS about $17,300. And the marginal tax rate says they're gonna owe the IRS some of the ballpark of $21,000, which is essentially like a $4,000 swing in estimates. So who's right? Well, I'd argue the marginal tax rate is way more effective at giving the taxpayer an accurate estimate as to how much they will owe the IRS. And the simple reason is all $90,000 of this Roth conversion, which to the IRS is treated as additional income, falls into that 24% tax bracket. So it makes it really simple to know about how much in tax liability will this add to your estimates for the year. Well, all 90,000 falls into the 24% bracket. So using that bracket makes a ton of sense. Now I'm kind of cheating a little bit because $90,000 completely falls into that 24% tax bracket. Whereas if I would have recommended a $100,000 Roth conversion, which you know could still totally be in their best interest, a portion of that Roth conversion would fall into the 32% tax bracket. Although it's a super small amount, maybe like five grand of that Roth conversion actually gets taxed at 32%. Um, but in that example, where your recommended Roth conversion falls into two tax brackets, well, then you end up just doing a weighted arithmetic mean or, or weighted average calculation anyways. Uh, but on a back of the napkin standpoint, generally using the marginal tax rate makes a lot of sense. Now this is the same applicability you could use when things like required minimum distribution start to hit, or if you're expecting to get a major commission pop or massive bonus, or you're gonna generate a bunch of capital gains and you need to estimate things on the margin rather than using a weighted average. I think using your marginal tax rate in circumstances where there's a big ad hoc change to your income is probably the safest bet for calculating things accurately. On the contrary though, when doing more long range uh, financial planning, I think using an effective tax rate is way simpler and more accurate. For example, if you're doing a 20, 30, 40 year tax projection and you're trying to estimate, hey, if you maintain the same lifestyle, how much should we plan on paying to the IRS and taxes in your 60s, 70s and 80s? Well, the income compilation might change a little bit in how things are broken up, but simple planning would show using a 19% or so effective tax rate is probably a safe bet looking forward. Now you might crystal ball it and say, well, tax rates are probably gonna go up in the future, so shouldn't you increase that effective rate? Yeah, you could totally do that and there's an argument to be made there, but all else being equal, if we expect tax rates to stay the same, which I wouldn't, but if you did, then using the 19% or so effective tax rate, I think is a very simple way of doing good long-term planning. It's also helpful when trying to decide uh, when you enter into retirement, how much of your various income sources should you be withholding for taxes? Well, if you just use a simple 19% or so in withholding from your various income sources, the math probably is all gonna equal out the same. Now, in that specific year, would I recommend doing a little bit more of a robust tax calculation? Totally. But if you're gonna DIY things and you're interested in keeping it super duper simple, using that effective tax rate, I think is a very simple way of going about it. Keep in mind though, as your income climbs, though your marginal tax rate might not change, for example, if that couple went from making 300 grand to 350 grand, their highest marginal bracket didn't change. It's still 24%, but their effective tax bracket totally changed. Their effective tax bracket is gonna go from 19% to 20 and maybe even higher. This concept is also what leads to people thinking that their bonuses are taxed at a higher rate than their salary. Technically, the IRS looks at all of your income as one big pot of money and then throws them onto those brackets that we looked at earlier. So your bonus isn't actually taxed at a higher rate than their salary. Odds are HR is gonna withhold a larger percentage of your bonus than you're used to having withheld from your salary because that bonus is being added to your income 
thus increasing your effective tax bracket. And so to compensate for your lack of increasing of your effective tax bracket withholding on your salary, they just increase the tax withholding on your bonus to compensate. That way it all ideally averages out so you don't owe the IRS a ton of money and you don't expect to get a huge massive tax refund, AKA you didn't massively overpay the IRS. Now, of course, you could always just tell HR how much to withhold from your bonus, but usually the default settings aren't too far off. So philosophically, which tax rate is better? It ultimately depends on the use case, and I would say they both have their merits. Using the marginal tax rate for doing ad hoc tax planning, I think can make a lot of sense and help you avoid underpaying the IRS. Whereas when doing more long-term financial planning and trying to figure out some tax rate to apply, the effective tax rate I have found is way easier and it's still pretty accurate. So hopefully that was helpful. If you have further questions, drop them in the comments below or get in touch on the website and we'll help you get squared away. Have an awesome rest of your week and we'll talk to you later. Bye.